let's jump into kind of a very simple case. Um, this is not where do I go to finish the biodiversity survey of my country, okay, or my region or my study area. This is a very simple case. It's where I know a little bit about a species and I want to know more, okay? Um, in a way, it's the very worst thing that one could do with the niche modeling framework. It's almost guaranteed not to get the full right answer, but it can be very useful in terms of conservation applications, uh, and I should be able to illustrate that for you. So again, this is the case where I know very little and I want to know more. So one of the things that over the years Adolfo and I have been fascinating with, fascinated with is this idea of what we call them unique type species. Essentially where a species is described from a single specimen and then never seen again. And those can be very interesting but also very frustrating because you essentially know the minimum possible. You know what one individual looked like and you know something about where it was. So again, it's kind of the worst case. It's something we probably should never be doing in the niche modeling world, but it works. So let's, let's jump into this a bit. It kind of goes back to this paper, which Jorge Soberon and another Mexican colleague and I published in 1999. And it was, it was very early in this, in this field. And essentially, all it boiled down to was we were wondering why we got what seemed to be bad results from these things that we weren't yet calling niche models. Okay, all we were doing was relating occurrence points to environmental layers. We had very few environmental layers. It's nothing like now where you have dozens or hundreds of, of data sets available to you. Um, and what we were trying to do was predict the distribution, that's what we thought. And so in Mexico, U.S. is up there, Guatemala is down here. You have this isthmus, which is a lowland isthmus, and the rest of Mexico is quite montane. And what, what we kept finding was if we were interested in a species kind of in the mountains of central Mexico, and we built one of these models that was designed to predict the distribution, we would always get predicted distributional area on the other side of the barrier. And so it was like, well, we're getting the wrong answer. But after we played with a lot of these things, we, we noticed one really curious thing, which was that when you had sister species, and you frequently do across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, when you had sister species, you could build a model for one and it would anticipate the distribution of the other, the sister species. That was kind of the key observation. Um, essentially what we, were, what we were finding was that um, for 37 pairs of species, which are ostensibly each other's closest relatives, probably fairly recent speciation events. What we were finding was you always got this ability to predict one another. We made the very tiny little inference that, oh, we're not talking about predicting the distribution, we're talking about identifying suitable conditions. And that turned out really to be the key. That turned out to be the key not only to this, which I'll go on about in a second, but it also turned out to be key in thinking about how do you anticipate potential distributions of invasive species, for example, or potential distributions in a changing climate. If you are identifying suitable conditions, and if you can seek those conditions on another continent or in another time period, all of a sudden you have the possibility of doing all those fun things that, that people are doing in the niche modeling world. 
so this was a pretty exciting time. Um, I think even, even the colleague who gives me least credit in the world admits that this was the, basically the first time that, that these models were tied to some version of an ecological niche. Um, so essentially what we did in this study was, was we took those 37 pairs of, of sister species and we asked how well they predicted each other. And as a, as a function of sample size, this is a function of essentially how well they, they predict each other. And what you can see is there's this increasing function. Essentially only at miserably small sample sizes do these predictions ever fail and do these things ever look not similar to one another. Okay? Just to be sure that we weren't looking at something artifactual, we then, for each species, picked a confamilial at random. So not the sister species, but something kind of related, kind of closely related. And here's the relationship for those confamilial species. Essentially, no relationship and very few statistically significant. So, the conclusion was that sister species share the same coarse-grained ecological niche, essentially an ecological niche defined with respect to climate variables. That was, that was essentially the base result, and the interpretation of that was that speciation, speciation mechanisms, at least in these, this set of birds, mammals, and butterflies, Speciation mechanisms don't commonly involve what's called ecological speciation, okay? That generally speciation is in spatial dimensions and it's probably a function of isolation and differentiation and isolation. But that the speciation event is not associated with ecological innovation, with changes in the conditions that you require for maintaining pop populations, okay? So that was kind of the basic conclusion of this study. It ends up being pretty important to what I'm getting at in this talk. But essentially the whole thinking framework, we call this the BAM diagram, um, but the whole framework is about species having some set of abiotic requirements. Sorry, Jesse and a couple others who were here or who are at the Nairobi course. Um, BAM diagram, abiotic requirements. Um, essentially, this is the idea of, of some set of requirements re with respect to temperature, humidity, uh, land cover. Can, it don't ha they don't have to be uh, environmental dimensions that make a lot of sense or that we can interpret or discuss, but the species may have some response to them. And that can be modified by biotic interactions and so our species can persist where both the abiotic and the biotic work. Okay, there may be some pollinator or some food item where if that's not present, you can't maintain populations. Or it might be the inverse, it might be the presence of some, some pathogen where that pathogen is present, you can't be. But this essentially goes to Hutchinson's fundamental ecological niche, and Hutchinson would have called this the, the uh, realized ecological niche. So as another consequence of that early paper that I just showed you, we realized that Hutchinson's framework was inadequate. Because this essentially implies that the species can be anywhere there. Which is, say, which is to say, in Hutchinson's world, everything's accessible. And so all of this can be colonized. Hutchinson's very curious, but he never really mentions the fact that species don't commonly, or at least, or maybe even don't ever, inhabit all suitable areas. And so, we essentially added to this one more consideration, which is that of accessibility. So 
I know I called it the BAM diagram and it's AAB, but you could call that mobility. Um, and we were trying to avoid anti-ballistic missiles, ABM, so we used the AM. But the idea is that of these conditions that are right abiotically and biotically, some portion of them are present and accessible. And so our species is only going to be found here. Okay? So you guys have lions. And I believe that if I were to take a nice sample of maybe 100 lions, get the sex ratio right, good young individuals, replicate the social structure, I believe that if I were to take lions to the New World, where there are no lions, I'm almost certain I could find the right conditions and start a viable population of lions. Probably there'd be some people not very happy with me. But essentially, some place, probably right where uh, Rafael and Thiago live, um, probably present pretty suitable conditions. It's tropical American savanna, but lions evolved in Africa and they have not made it across the Atlantic Ocean and so they're not in America. What do you think, guys? Would, would Brazil accept a bit of a, an experiment to test a scientific model? have planned to make uh, kind of safari parks in the in Cerrado for tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe it will work. In fact, uh, I was just in Colombia in May and there was a, a Colombian drug lord, Escobar, and he had, I mean, he, he basically, much of southern Colombia he dominated and he had these incredible estates. And one of the things he was really into was, was African game. And so he imported, among other animals, hippopotamus. And when the government finally actually shot him to death on the roof of his house, um, <coughs> his estates were essentially abandoned for a while. And the hippopotamus got out and we're colonizing rivers and multiplying, et cetera, et cetera. And I think they've, they've now captured all of them, at least they're pretty visible. Um, but I think they've, they've gotten them all now into captivity. My point is, there aren't hippopotamus or lions in the New World, and you guys don't have hummingbirds, you just have sunbirds, which are nowhere near as cool as hummingbirds. <laughs> but it's all because of these barriers, okay? So kind of the structure of thinking about distributional ecology is then that there are sets of sites that are suitable abiotically. Biotic interactions may or may not restrict that farther. But amongst that set of sites that works bio biotically and abiotically, some are accessible and some are not. Okay? So what we're trying to do in niche modeling, ideally, is estimate this, and in reality, we estimate something less than that, okay? I don't want to get into that. It's a big methodological mess, and essentially most of the field is using these tools completely wrong. Uh, but what I want you to think about is this. What we're doing in the niche modeling world is we're essentially using occurrences in geography to identify sets of environments where the species has occurred. We then use some trick to fit a model around the occurrences in environmental space and then we use that model to come back to geography. That's the whole process. But again, we're not going into this. There's a big uh, set of videos, I think it was like 62 videos, uh, from the niche modeling course. Some of you were there. What I want you to think about is this. When we take a single piece of environmental space, 
we can look at its projection on geography. And so I took this area that has kind of fairly low temperatures and low precipitation, and what I get is the taiga belt across northern North America. But I also get this slender string down the higher parts of the Andes in South America. Okay? I know of dozens of endemics here, hundreds of endemics here, but I know of no species that inhabits that whole area and nowhere else. Okay, that's the effect of that M, sir. But really what we're after here is that you can take any point in environmental space and see that set of conditions over here. And that's what we're gonna do in this, in this little section. We're gonna take maybe that single point where that single example of that species is known from. We're gonna look at environments very similar to it, very close to it in environmental space, and we're gonna see where they fall out on geography. So kind of a first exploration in this uh, realm I did with a colleague at the American Museum and several colleagues in Mexico. Um, and essentially here what we were doing was looking at chameleon distributions in Madagascar and a group from the American Museum in New York and uh, the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology had been working essentially for one guy's entire career across Madagascar and had distributional data for a bunch of different chameleon species. And essentially what we started doing was developing these really simple, really crude niche models, because this was 10 or 11 years ago. So right away you should be able to see this kind of ugly pixelation. That is the sort of climate data we had available back then. But what you can see is the occurrence data and then you can see some areas where they look suitable, but there aren't any occurrences. 